Thank you, Carl Nicolas, for organizing this really nice seminar that I really enjoy every second Thursday. So I would like to talk today about uh, the use of cyanobacteria as catalysts. And then we can also discuss if this is actually uh, such a good idea, just a bit of motivation. So I think this is something that everyone knows. But um, I just want to highlight here that we have like the two challenges. We have like the depletion of fossil resources and we have an ongoing climate change. And uh, as a solution, we need clean processes and we need to use renewable resources. And here, enzymatic reactions are heavily investigated because they offer mild reaction conditions. They um, are selective. So this uh, offers us a nice ethyl efficiency or ethyl economy, and we come to this concept. And we can use enzyme cascade reactions. So what happens in the cell is that we have 10, 20 consecutive reactions. We can do this now also in cell-free system and save a lot of reaction steps. And we can produce enzymes in large scale. This is sometimes forgotten when we talk about catalysts. But if you make a reaction with a rhodium catalyst and you want to go to plant scales, then you need kilograms of rhodium. And from an enzyme, we can just use a big tank and make a lot. And enzymes can be optimized. And this said, um, biocatalysis is now a widely used method in the pharmaceutical industry, in the chemical industry. The challenge is now a bit to go towards bulk chemicals, so large scale products. This I will also come back later to talk. So this is here a bit about the activity of my group. So um, I work mostly with enzymes, isolated enzymes you see here on the left side, and um, the chemical reaction scheme of a substrate, which can lead to two products. And with enzymes, we can steer the reaction to two possible products. And this here is just the basic scheme of so-called prophenes, they are painkillers. So, um, and I warn you, we will have a lot of chemical structures, unfortunately, because we talk here about using cyanobacteria as catalysts for chemical reactions. And what we do is we enzyme the enzymes by protein engineering, and then we use them by biocatalysis. And since so a couple of for a couple of last years, we um, use enzymes for light-driven biotransformations and also for hydrogen-driven hydrogen -driven biotransformations. And I would like to explain now why. So first, these are just a few examples of enzymatic uh, radius reactions. So um, you see here on the top the reduction of the double bond. This gives us then here, for instance, the, this compound here. You see this that stands for a stereocenter. Or we can um, reduce a keto in a carbonyl group from a ketone to an alcohol. This is used here for the production of this intermediate of your Lipitor. We can also make a reductive amination with different enzymes, go from a ketone to an amine, or we can insert oxygen into a molecule. For instance, we can produce the couple, epsilon cupolactone, which is a polymer precursor. And all of these reactions have in common that they need redox cofactors. So this means there are reactions where we transfer electrons between molecules, and nature does this with redox cofactors. So we always consume one molecule in a DH or in a DH sometimes also paradoxine, and then we produce the oxidized version of this. And this cofactor is very expensive. So like a kilogram costs several thousand euros. And therefore, what is done is in the second reaction, this cofactor is reduced again. So this can be done in the cell, this can be done in the cell free system. And here I gave you four examples how this can be done. For instance, we can use formic acid to release carbon dioxide or isopropanol, and then we would produce acetone. Acetone is volatile, carbon dioxide is a gas, so this shifts also the reaction to the product side. And these two compounds is already tells us something about um, the, um, the possibility to bring something to implementation. Formic acid is a side product of the paper industry, so there are thousands of times produced and actually this waste. And this is a fantastic reaction. The problem is the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction, formic acid dehydrogenase, is not stable enough. So this system never made it to uh, implementation, even though it is much better. And isopropanol to acetone is a very problematic reaction because we only use one electron pair and we generate a co-product, which then we have to do something with that. So um, the ethyl economy of the process, which is all the atoms of our substrate and the co-substrate, and um, in relation to the atoms of the product, 
this with this reaction is very problematic. If you use glucose, we produce gluconolactone, also only one electron pair. Or if we do this within a cell, then a large part of the energy age will be used for restoration. So, which is also a poor atom economy. But from the example of formic acid, we learn the um, catalyst with the best atom economy is not always the one that makes it. And this is something we have to keep in mind for cyanobacteria. But um, a couple of years ago, uh, in the discussion with Mark Novaschik from uh, Bochum, we discussed the possibility to substitute these auxiliary substrates with water because cyanobacteria can do that. They have the capacity to use electrons from water and reduce energy plus to energy pH. And then we can bring an oxidoreductase. And we can do this basically with every oxidoreductase for a reductive biotransformation just by simply overexpressing the gene in a cyanobacteria. And um, cyanobacteria are often discussed as production organisms. Um, last month, there was a talk here about PHV production. This uses carbon dioxide fixation. And here, a colleague of mine, Yagut, called this a substrate in product out approach. So here we use the cyanobacterium as a catalyst. So we add a substrate and we isolate a product. So this, uh, the whole process does not touch or it's not, does not involve carbon dioxide fixation which makes it a bit um, different than other processes that try to use cyanobacteria for biotechnology. So this looks very nice on paper. And this is how we imagine it would work. So we have here the photosynthetic electron transport chain and the FNR reduces NADPH. And this NADPH then we use here with our enzyme to make a substrate to a product, so for instance, to reduce here this double bond. And I just would like to draw your attention here to the reaction equation. So we have light, water, a substrate, and we get product and oxygen. And this has been referred to a colleague from chemistry as a dream reaction. The question is now, does this stay a dream or will this become reality? Also, the, um, if we have a fast reaction here, we add an additional electron sink to the metabolism of the cyanobacteria. So we can also see what this will mean for them, if they can tolerate this and what kind of consequences this has for the metabolism. This said, we made a feasibility study. We expressed a gene called YQGM. This is a double bond reductase, which activates this active, which reduces here this double bond. Here you see the product formation over the time, and with 10 millimolar, 15 millimolar, 20 millimolar, and with a low optical density, we could convert the compound within a few hours, which was really exciting. And uh, you see here, this EE means enantiomeric excess. So this means we really produce only one of the two stereoisomers. So this reaction is really highly selective. We were not sure about this. At the beginning, we were also a bit afraid that there might be other reductases in silicon cysts or other reductive processes. But this is also an indication that really our enzyme does the job. And of course, we also had negative control. So since then, uh, here, this is just how we cultivate the cells. And this here is an NMR spectrum of chemically produced uh, methyl succinamide. And this is what we get directly after extraction from the cyanobacteria. So the unexpected advantage of the method is this reaction is already quite pure. We didn't, did not need to purify it. And I found this very surprising. And then a colleague from Natural Product Synthesis told me that actually cyanobacteria, if you produce something you get it quite pure, which is a big difference to E. coli, where you have the complex medium and you have to separate the compound from other media components. And product workup is quite important. So this was something that we liked very much when we saw it. I remember the postdoc saying, wow, we don't need to make a column here. And since then, there are different examples. So we and others, uh, so many groups now in biocatalysis actually investigate this. So this becomes like a hot topic. And you see here down, we can make amines. You can also make chiral amines. We, we can here produce um, lactones. Some of these lactones could be used as polymer precursors. And here the in reduction. And here, this is um, sort of the rate. So the rates differ. Some reactions go like the typical rates, four to 10 units. And this particular reaction, goes very fast. So we have here a rate of 100 units per gram cellular rate. So we consume a lot of NADPH. This compound itself has no application. It is more a model for a stereoselective synthesis. But I hope I won't, won't disappoint you. We are not curing cancer here or diabetes. This is only a model for a fine chemical, but it is a very fast reaction. 
So, so this is what I will focus on this talk from now on. And if you now look, I mean, we have here now some examples, this is very nice, but the question is if you just want to go on just showing that this works with many other enzymes or if you really want to apply it. And this, there we have to look on two aspects. So the process is always measured with the amount of product we can produce in a certain time. So how many, if I have a tank, I can use this ta tank 50 times per year, once per week, and, and then I can produce every week 50 kilogram. This is the amount of product I can produce and this finances all my costs from personnel to maintenance to, to invest, everything. And this is reflected in the volumetric productivity, which is millimole per liter per hour or gram per liter per hour, maybe tons per liter per hour. If, of course, if I use more enzyme or more cells, I get more product. And at a certain point, the enzyme production or the cell production becomes expensive. So therefore, we also have the productivity. This means how many uh, micromole I can produce per milligram of cells, or how many, if I have one kilogram of cells, how many tons can I produce? These are the two, um, and one of the first results that we have actually is, if we increase the cell density, the specific activity of the cells goes down, which is something very problematic actually. And um, here I just show you something which has been extracted from many papers, which you see it down here. This are the success criteria for such a biocatalytic reaction once it is really used in an industrial environment. So I need to convert all my substrate to product. I think this is pretty clear. And here this EE, this is the optical purity. This is just a property of the enzyme, should be very high. But I should do so at a high substrate loading, 100 gram per liter. And I should convert 100 gram per liter per day, otherwise it's too expensive. Or even 300 gram per liter per day for oil chemicals. And with, so with my biocatalyst, with one gram, I should produce 50 gram of product. And here the cofactor I think is not so important because we're working with cells. And then it depends what I do with my product. So for a bulk chemical like ethylene, I should produce 2,000 two tons with one ki kilogram cell dry weight. This is a lot. For pharmaceuticals, it's less. 10 kilogram per kilogram is sufficient. This looks nicer. But on the other hand, for pharmaceuticals, I get such a high price that glucose addition here or isopropanol addition is negligible. So for pharmaceuticals, nobody's interested to, uh, to use cyanobacteria because glucose is so cheap. And for biochemicals where the carbon source matters, we must be extremely successful to, uh, efficient to be successful. And this here is a bit kind of dilemma to find a niche for our cyanobacterial um, reaction. So this is just a bit the framework where we are. And here, um, just one picture here about the cell density limitation I want to talk about. This is here a reactor we got from a group in Erlangen. And you see here the nuclear cyst is an optical density of two. Looks very nice, very even light distribution. But as soon as we have an optical density of 10, which is 2.4 gram per liter, you already see the fluctuating light. So, and 2.5 gram per liter is by no means a high cell density. So, E. coli, you can work easily for many reactions with an optical density. Uh, 40 gram per liter also. So this means we are quite limited, we knew that. And here we also see this now in larger scale. And coming back, what can limit our reaction if we want to make it faster? One thing always we should not forget is the transport of subtrate and product. But luckily for us, this is not a problem in our case. So I will not talk about this. We need to talk about the intracellular enzyme concentration and of course the NADPH supply. And these are the two aspects I want to look today. So the objectives were to make this reaction faster and to see, can we actually also implement it in a scalable setting, in a setting that can actually made and scaled up to larger volumes. We chose this because this reaction is so fast. So we think it's NADPH limited and also light dependent. So we wanted to optimize this specific activity by cell engineering. On the one hand, by producing more enzyme in the cell, and on the other hand, by providing more NADPH. And the second part of the talk will be about the upscale. And here, oh, this is a bit of a mistake. It should be internal illumination, not external illumination, just sort. And now we have to look a bit how this enzyme works. So we teamed up with a colleague, Peter Mascharo, who um, 
has a stock flow uh, device, so he could get the kinetics of the enzyme. And this so-called inreductase has a two-step reaction. In the first step, our oxidized enzyme is reduced by NADPH. And then in this step, we get the oxidized NADP and we have the reduced enzyme. And then in the second step, NADP is released, our substrate binds and is reduced. And with the stop flow device, we can first fully reduce the purified enzyme. And in the second step, then measure the rate of the second step. So here you see classical mechanical kinetics of the NADPH dependent reduction of the enzyme. With a Km value and or a Kd of 40 micromolar. And this meant if the NADPH concentration within the cell is below 600 micromolar, the enzyme would slow down. And I think between 300 and 600, if you look at values for E. coli, these are the total concentrations of nicotinamide cofactors. So this means the Km of our enzyme is in a way that we would, that any reduction of NADPH concentration would slow down the enzyme. The second half reaction you see here is only almost linear. And this is because at 250 micromolar, the reaction was so fast, we couldn't measure it anymore. And this means here at 250 micromolar substrate, the rate is 50 times faster than that of the first reaction. So this means this particular enzyme, uh, whenever there is a reduced enzyme molecule, immediately a substrate oxidizes it to this back. So this means this enzyme is continually oxidized and um, oxidizes in turn in the DPH. So the enzyme reaction itself is NADPH limited. And this means also the rate should um, depend on the NADPH concentration within the cell. So the first thing we checked. So if we have an enzyme operating below its Km value, let us, let's imagine we have here an NADPH concentration of 400 micromolar. We have two ways to make the reaction faster. The first way is to produce more enzyme. Then we have more enzyme molecules that operated that operate at sub at unsaturating conditions, but more enzyme makes the reaction faster. So this would mean we can try to use a stronger promoter, for instance, in xenocystis to produce more enzyme. The other way is to give the enzyme more NDPH. We keep the enzyme concentration constant, but we move in this diagram to the right side, and the enzyme moves towards saturation, and also we get more product. So in this case, usually in biology we are used to have one limiting factor. In this case, two factors can actually lead to a higher um, reaction rate. One advantage of this reaction is we can quantify the, the product very easily by gas chromatography. And of course, we can measure our cell density, for instance, by uh, the chlorophyll content. And this means we can really get precise reaction rates. And for instance, one rate that we measured was 680 micromole per milligram chlorophyll per hour. And there are, um, there are estimations of the NADPH photoproduction. This one we took from a paper from Kony and Sativ. And they estimated a rate between 500 and 1,000. And the um, direction conditions of both are very different, of course, different cultivation conditions and different um, uh, measurement. But the rate here is already in the same order of magnitude than this estimation of photo production. So this means this can mean a substantial NADPH consumption for the cell. I don't think we can say more here, but this is already quite a high rate. And to have a more look into this, we teamed up with Mark Mwaszczyk. And Mark Mwaszczyk used pump fluorescence to measure NADPH decays. So these measurements were done in his lab, and also they were done at a very low cell density of optical density of one. And you see here the decay. So here we switch off the light. And you see here the decay of our cells with the inreductase and um, without substrate. And I do not show you here the wild type because um, the wild type showed the same decay. And then if we add the substrate before, if the, the system had the time to equilibrate, we see a much faster decrease. And this actually, this decrease, we think, has something to do with the electron consumption of the enzyme. So this is something we can see in this fluorescence experiments. And here you see, um, here's the wild type. So here, addition of the substrate doesn't change much. We used here a very weak promoter. We also do not see much. But if we use either the PSPA2 promoter or the CPC promoter, we see a very strong increase of the decay. 
And this is an indication that in both cases, we actually consume a lot of NADPH. So this actually shows us NADP, the NADPH concentration is important. And we know if we consume NADPH and lower the concentration, this will slow down our enzyme reaction. So just a technical thing is um, we uh, use just simple genomic integration of our enzymes uh, into neutral sites. We use genomic integration, not plasmids, because in some cases, we have a lot of problems with unstable genes. So the cells lose and the activity in the redox reaction after a few weeks of cultivation. And to be on the safe side, we always work with genome integration. This here are two, three different promoters. We had a look and uh, investigated. And this is how the experiment looks like. So we cultivate the cells in, under these conditions in this device or in a different, in an air flask or whatever. And we also know that the cultivation conditions are quite important for a second experiment. Then we have the phase of the biotransformation. And uh, in the biotransformation, we add our substrate, we add the product. And as I said, the rate the measure here depends a bit from these conditions. And we also concentrate the cells here. So we harvest them here at low optical density of one or two in order so that they should have a lot of photosynthetic activity. And then we harvest them here um, at a uh, use, for instance, optical density of 10 or even 20. Then we analyze our product in a gas chromatograph, for instance, or we even isolate the product and quantify it simply with a, with a scale and me measure the optical purity. So here we thought first about the enzyme concentration. So we used um, three promoters and we used this PZ under two different conditions. So where we thought it's induced or uninduced. This would give us a different intracellular enzyme concentration. And here um, on the left side, you see the activity of the enzyme when we open the cells. So we add NADPH and then we measure the reaction rate of a cell-free extract in order to see how much enzyme is there. And here you see rates in whole cell experiments. We did not show here the um, results with the weak promoter because we did not see enzyme here in the cell-free extract, the activity was too low. But what we saw is that the two stronger promoters, we actually have a correlation. So if we have more stronger promoter here, the PCPC under these conditions obviously was stronger, we have more enzyme in the cell-free extract, and also the whole cell biotransformation gets faster. And if we use here the sweet promoter or the sweeter promoter, we get a much lower activity. So this tells us the, with the enzyme ratio and um, um, concentration, we can control the rate. And here, the activity increase was a bit lower than the increase in the cell-free extract. And this is an indication that also the NDPH concentration might be limiting if we have too much enzyme. So but this just in small scale, this works nicely. And here, um, a rate of 100 uh, units per gram cells. This is a very nice rate for whole cell biocatalysis. So then thinking about NDPH, we thought, what about um, the strategy to increase NADPH supply by removal of electron sinks? So we tried several inhibitors, for instance, uh, for Kelvin cycle, and uh, none of the inhibitors gave us a desired result. So this was not as easy as we thought of. And then we got the idea, um, actually this was suggested by a referee of a proposal, to use these flavo D iron proteins and then we asked Jagut Ala Gladieva if she can send us her mutants. And she did. So we overexpressed our enzymes in uh, FLAV1 FLAV and FLAV3 uh, knockout variants in order because we hoped that um, this, this NADPH consumption would be avoided. So these enzymes, the flavo enzymes, they reduce oxygen to water and either NADPH or, as I've heard, phenodoxine is oxidized. This is a photoprotection, and this actually is a kind of futile cycle, protects the cells, which is not so much needed under controlled cultivation conditions. And here's what we got. You see here the whole cell biotransformation of the um, FLAV1 and FLAV3 knockout. And you see here the silicon cystis background. The dark bars shows we also see a reaction in darkness. This is a bit counterintuitive, but um, I'm talking about initial rates. And obviously, at the beginning of the reaction, the cells have still some storage sugars they can mobilize and use for NADPH um, production. And we clearly see 
that we have a higher specific activity and also have a much higher um, a product formation rate in millimolar per hour. This might be caused by a higher enzyme concentration in the cells. And this is why we checked here, we opened the cells again and checked about the enzyme concentration. And in this mutants, we have the same enzyme concentration in the cell free extract. So here with the same amount of enzyme, we get different rates. And this is an indication that these particular cells have more NADPH. So we were quite surprised by how strong that effect was. And um, here you see how the how close in the experiment. This is here the rate of the um, zinnicot sisters with the our inner case. And here you see product formation with the FLAV1 and FLAV3 knockout. We also investigated this at different cell densities. And an optical, at an optical density of two, we didn't see much. We needed a moderate optical density, for instance, of 10 in order to see here clear effect. And you know, I think here you see with the lower rate here, 10 clearly shows there's less light for the cells. They, have, they can provide less NADPH. So this would be here something where we have an NADPH limitation. Um, in biocatalysis, you always need to show that a result is robust. So this should not work only with one substrate. We used here different substrates and got to a quite interesting result for three compounds. We did see the activity increase here in uh, blue of the flat one knockout, but with this compound, we didn't see any increase. But you see here the, over, the overall activity is much lower. So one explanation could here be that um, the reaction is so slow that there is no NADPH limitation. We also should not forget, I and mean, it is a bit difficult to interpret these experiments because these compounds also have a slightly toxic effect on the cells. So this could be much more complex, but we, could, we can show this here with different substrates. So this is a robust result. And with this set, I want to come for the second part, which is a way now to achieve an upscale. So everything I showed you so far was on a very small scale and one milliliter scale, where we think there's a lot of light penetration. And if we look to literature, some people work at low optical density, only one. Others work in small scales. So all of these biotransformations so far are shown in very small reactors and with reason, because then we have, no, then we have not so much safe shading of the cells. And in order to scale the reaction, we stumbled upon the work from uh, Rainer Buchholz from Erlangen. He developed in his group an algae bioreactor that uses internal illumination by LEDs. I think Florian Budroff already last month or so um, explained this idea. So the story of this reactor is the Buchholz group um, developed it. And they showed here with Chlamydomonas, here with three gram per liter, that in the internal illumination, there's a nice light distribution within the reactor and external illumination is quite dark. And we saw here three gram per liter. This looked very promising. So we thought these are the cell densities we want to work with. Let's try out. And you see here, this is what we have. And yeah, at 2.4 gram per liter of OD10, the light is already quite fluctuating. So, and this reactor is producing a lot of heat. So these LEDs and the sun bacteria, we really need to cool this down to room temperature, but it works and here, you see the reaction rate of the reaction I showed you before at an optical density here of two. And you see here the amount of LED beads has only a moderate effect. But if we go for a moderate cell density of five, we see here already a strong effect if we have more of this internal wireless light emitters. And this clearly shows the internal illumination really here has a strong effect on the rate. Here you see reaction progress at two different optical densities. So you see within a few hours, we can achieve full conversion. And here on the left side, you see the specific activities. Also with internal illumination, the specific activity goes down. And you see here the product formation rate on the right side. So the best conditions actually were obtained with an OD of five. Then we have here the highest efficiency of the cells and the best product formation rate. So sometimes we use here OD10 or OD5. OD10 is for us 2.4 gram per liter. So here you see the comparison now of the one milliliter scale and the 200 milliliter scale. So this here is the small GC vials um, for the one milliliter. In blue, you at higher cell density, OD10, we have a slight decrease of the specific activity. This decrease is stronger in the larger reactor, but this larger reactor can be scaled because we simply can now fill up this column as high as you want without increasing the diameter. 
So this, so this rate here, we can only obtain really in small GC vials, and this is actually quite useless. And here we are now in a system, we can make this column as long as we want, if you wish to. So this is something which actually could be used for production. And we are quite happy that we still have here a rate of, let's say, 30 to 40 units per gram cell guard rate. So this year, of course, there's always a comparison internal and external illumination. So uh, this is uh, here a comparison of uh, an optical density of five. This is 40 wireless light emitters. This is uh, external LED stripes, and this is a dark reaction. I told you in darkness, we see some initial conversion. And at OD10, it's more pronounced, obviously such a big colon with this thermal illumination is not a good idea. So, but we really, really see here the benefit of internal illumination. So and then we, uh, so this is very fresh data. We performed a so-called preparative batch. So after the reaction, we stopped the reaction and isolated the product. We added two times 20 millimolar. You see here the product formation. Um, first, we saw we can convert 10 millimolar substrate fully within four hours. And then the students added two times 20 millimolar. We could isolate 71%. You see here this powder is optically pure. So this means really we can use the cells as catalysts. And with a moderate cell density, actually can produce it with a rate of four millimolar per hour nicely our product. And this here is a purity again in NMR spectrum. Here's just to show this was amazingly pure directly after the um, isolation. And it is a big advantage if you do not need to purify the chemical product with the colon chromatography. So with this, I would like to come already to my conclusion. And I hope I could show you that if you use cyanobacteria, we can perform radar spiral catalysis without the addition of auxiliary substrates. So, and I think the rates are fast enough to actually implement this. Um, if you want to produce anything in cyanobacteria, we really have to look at reaction rates and the yields possible. I remember the um, talk from Moritz, I think four weeks ago on PHV. He brought up this topic about PHV. For anything we want to produce, these rates will be very important because we need to compete with established heterotropic hosts. Glucose is really not so expensive. And also I'm thinking now if I want to talk for Ivonic or Bayer and convince them to skip their fermenters and put in um, cold and bubble reactors with internal illumination, I think we need to do a lot of convincing for that. I hope I could show you, we can increase the rate of these reactions by the deletion of electron six. So the principle is there. So this means we can make these reactions even faster, even though just the uh, knockout of, an, of a single gene is quite drastic. So I think there might be um, better and more efficient methods to achieve that. And here, what, what, we, what we have now is a rate in a totally scalable reactor of four millimolar per hour. If you look this up the same reaction literature with E. coli, you can be much faster, but this is already something. So this is where we are right now. And with this, I would like to thank the people who actually were involved in this. So uh, Mark actually introduced me to the topic of cyanobacteria with him. We set this up and we have a nice collaboration in this uh, photo biocut ITN. Peter Mascharo, he helped us with the kinetics of the enzyme, which was very useful to understand a bit what's going on inside the cell. And Jagut um, provided us the FLV variants. We have also very nice collaboration with her, where we actually learn a lot. And I must say about cyanobacteria, our learning curve is still very steep. And Selin Kara collaborated with us. She's a technical biocatalyst on the scaling of the reaction. Hannah and Lean uh, worked on the electron sink in their PhD thesis. Giovanni is trying to make those reactions faster with um, addition of sugar in order to see how fast we can go. And Lenny, Yelena, and Marcos um, worked on the colon bubble reactor. And with this, I would like to come to conclusion and thank again Ilka here and Nicolas for giving me the opportunity to talk. And I, of course, I thank you for your attention.